Psalms chapter 61 to the chief musician upon Nigi Nigga Nigganalif getting the baby theme. This is a string instrument, a psalm of David. Hear my cry, O God, and this is not crying boo hoo. This is crying out to God. Attend unto my prayer. This is a prayer. It's a psalm. It's a prayer. Ever think about singing to God your prayers? There's nothing I ever heard preached. Never I heard anything uh, said out of the pulpit or, or any learning. Psalm is your, again, it's your Bible hymnal. And how many hymn, how many psalms of 150 are actually in your hymnal in the church? But we have a hymnal in our Bible. Um, I have one that was in my head right now and it's going away. Uh, there are some, but not many. Maybe if we were to take string instruments and put these two words in a hymnal, maybe our music would be better. I mean, you got to know what the motive is behind the, behind the writer. And today, the, the music that's today, you got to question the motive. Now, when you get the old time, Fanny Crosby, she loved the Lord. But even some of hers, her hymns are wrong. I'm sorry to say. And the Amazing Grace will be there for, for 10,000 years. No, we're not. There's no, there's no time in eternity. But if we were to take our hymnals and our hymns from the book of Psalms, we would be without error. From the end of the earth. Well, David, he, he thought, we know the earth is round. David didn't know the earth was round unless the Lord showed him something. You look out there in a vast, I saw the a day on Facebook, somebody took a picture of Texas, I've heard how flat Texas is, and you just look out, and it's like, it truly looks like an end. You look out over the ocean, you go down to Daytona Beach, look at it, well, what, you think, it, you know, the ocean just falls off, you can't see no more island, you can't see no land, and they're out in the desert. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. And David's saying there, no matter where I am. Remember, David in his lifetime, he's in Philistines. He's in Jerusalem. He's running all around. Wherever I am, I will cry unto thee, God. And I stress in, my, in the teachings and the readings, which I mark my Bible, for the pronouns of, of God. And how much, when you mark the pronouns of God and Jesus Christ and the and the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and all that. It's amazing how much your Bible comes alive. The Bible says, who has marked this word? Oh, I definitely do. When my heart, there's the heart again. It's the heart. For with the heart, man believes on the righteousness. With the heart, a, a fool will say there's no God. For when my heart is overwhelmed, What do you think Israel thought when they were at the Red Sea? Uh, here's this big body of water, and right behind him, here comes the Egyptians. Now, if you're going to be so pious and holy, say, you would not have feared. Moses says, stand still and see, see the, you know, the Lord. Do, and the Lord's like, go. And, and I just imagine Moses is thinking his head, or oh, there's a body of water here. And lift up thy rod. Oh, okay. I know that this rod of God has done things before. Overwhelms when you come to a place and you cannot go nowhere. Unless God opens up the, the, the waters. That's overwhelmed. Overwhelmed is when 
John is walking through the water and it's up to his ankles. It's up to his, his knees. It's up to his, his, his loins. It's up to his, and then it's, it's over his head. That's overwhelming. When there's absolutely nothing you can do. And then you say, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. A rock is something you want to stand on. You don't want to stand on sand. You don't want to stand in mud. You don't want to stand on water. That, that's not going to happen to you. Uh, no, Psalms don't have the dates. Well, a few many thousand years when Jesus walks on the water. Even Peter, look, he tried to walk out in the water and he began to sink. Jesus said, a man that does what, what he says will build his house upon a rock. Him that does not do what I say and follow the sayings that I speak, he builds it upon the sand and when the storms come. Listen, the storm has already come. I'm already being overwhelmed. Move me to the rock. Now we know that rock is Jesus Christ. David didn't know it was Jesus Christ. When Moses says, Lord, let me see your glory, God says, I'm going to cleft the rock. I'm going to put you in there. And I believe he says that the rock is going to cover him. When Israel is going through the wilderness and they get the water, they get the water from a flinty rock. Now, if, there's a wall, if there is ever a rock that's not going to give you water, a flint rock, when you use a lighter, that lighter has a little piece of rock in it and it's flint. Well, they may not today, but way back when, when they actually used real things, that, you know, your products didn't have to say made with real, well, what are you going to do, make with artificial? Yeah, they do make with artificial. You get more lemon in your dishwasher detergent than you do in your drinks. Well, they probably don't use flint in lighters, but flint is not a water lock, rock. It's not moisture. It's put me on a rock. God, you put me on a rock. Don't let me go on a rock. I may be on the wrong rock. They put lighthouses to warn you of rocks for ships. For thou, God, has been a shelter for me. A shelter from the storm is to, is to him. A place to stay, a place to rest without getting wet, without being too cold, without the wind being blown on you. A shelter from a wind, uh, from a, a sandy desert windstorm. It's a place of protection. And a strong tower from the enemy. From the enemy. Protection against the enemy. Strong towers where you go in for defense or offense. It's either used for either or. You're defending your city. Meanwhile, you can use it to attack. You got people at the, at the gates that you don't want there. You can turn that tower and attack on them. Mostly it's a defense. <coughs> It's a place of armament. It's a place to be when you're in a battle. Our strong tower today is the armor that God gives us in Ephesians 6. Find anywhere in the New Testament for the church that says to go into a tower. I don't even think you can find tower. You know, a Christian is a unique soldier. If you look at the combat in trench warfare, World War One, World War Two, was when they came to, they built trenches, and the soldiers would stand in the trench. It would be just high enough for them to shoot their gun, and the only thing they really would be seen would be their head. Their whole body would be in the in the ground in the bunker, and their body, except for their head, would be protected. And they stood and fire. It was a it was a safe place. Only thing probably grenades would come in or, and missiles and stuff like that would come in and get you. But, I mean, if it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, it was a safe place to be. But Jesus Christ tells us as Christians, get out of the bunker, get out of the trench, and stand on the battlefield and fight. Put the armor on and fight. He never tells us to sleep. 
And our armor does not protect, if you go to Ephesians 6 and look, it does not protect our back or rear end. If you show up in heaven with a butt wound, that's not a million dollar wound, according to the army. When you get shot in the butt, that's called a, a million dollar wound. It also raises a lot of questions. How would you do that? You were facing the wrong way or some idiot behind you. How many Christians are going to have butt wounds? And you know what? At the judgment seat of Christ, every butt wound you have, you're going to have to give an account. How about that? You're called to stand. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. Well, wait, he, on the run from, from Saul, the tabernacle's over there, and he's over there, over there, over there, over here. The Bible says in the New Testament, we are the tabernacle. We are the temple. David longs to be where the Lord is, and that's at the tabernacle in the Old Testament. David one time went out, looked at, the looked at it, and he said, you know what? I dwell amongst seal and ceilings of, of, of fir, of cedar trees. I live in luxury. I look down there, and I see a curtain. I'm living better than God is living. That's a love for the Lord. David wanted to be with God and did not want to depart from God at all. And when he was on the strong tower one night, when he should have been on the battlefield with Joab and the men, see, you better be where God wants you to be not be where you want to be. Oh, we're going to be in the tower. Well, maybe God doesn't want you in the tower. You be with God where God is, even if that's on the battlefield. Because if you be where you want to be in your bedroom where you're not to be, that's not where God was. God was on the battlefield with Joab. You better get that and learn that. You better be dwelling where God is dwelling. And you better check yourself. Again, like I say, when you've when you, when you got time and you're alone all by yourself, you ask God, say, Lord, what sins are not covered? And God will answer. How about this prayer? I pray also. Lord, am I where you want me to be right now? And most of that prayer is when I'm sleeping, in, well, I'm laying in bed. And I mean it literally. Lord, is this the bed where you want me to be in? If I'm to be in Daytona Beach right here on, on, on this street, on this road. Then I'm in the perfect will of God. We've got to seek that from God. We've got to make sure that we're dwelling where God is dwelling. You say, how do you feel about Daytona Beach, Florida? I don't care how I feel. This is where God wants me. I will sit in the church, and I will sit in that pew, and say, that, Lord, is this the church where you want me to be? And you know what the answer I've gotten. And you've got to ask yourself, is this where you want me to be? That will keep you out of trouble. Had David said, Lord, Is this where I belong in bed right now? I, I know that you know what God wouldn't answer him. Because you knew God knew what was going to happen. You see what happens when we sin? We don't ask God about the tabernacle. But we don't have it. Yes, we do. We have a dwelling with God. When you read Pilgrim's Progress, you realize there are many times he went off the path. And one of those paths, he goes into a, a castle and ends up in a, in a, in a dungeon. Enslaved by, uh, by a, a, uh, a giant. Why? Because he was not dwelling where God was. He left. You know, what, you know what the Holy Spirit told Paul, I think, three or four times? Don't go to Jerusalem. Oh, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit sent men of God to him and said, Don't go, Paul. Wraps himself in the girls, and the man in this girls, and you know, oh, don't feel sorry for me. I'm going to go, and 
God wanted Paul in Rome, and the only way God could get Paul in Rome was by chains. For Paul, God was, his tabernacle, his dwelling was in Rome. You know what? You better, uh, with the life of Paul and what we have, you better not have God bring you in chains to where he wants you, because he may not. One day, Demas told God, I'm going to leave the tabernacle. See you later. Bye. You find me where, where God says, stop. Now, you know Paul warned him. You may get outside the tabernacle. God says, okay, go. Fine. I ain't going. I'll stay right here. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Now, the cover is a covered Hid, private, or concealed. Now, God don't have wings. We've already talked about this the other night. But this is like a chicken. And I read it. I, read, I looked at some things where the chicks will go underneath the mother hen. She makes some kind of motion, whatever it is of the mother. The chicks realize it. And know, okay, it's time to go run under mommy. And it's almost like, the mother and her chicks become one big bird. And if you don't, if a little chicky doesn't listen, he doesn't pay attention, he's going to do his own thing. The fox or the coyote or whatever it is out there now has himself a chicken dinner. Have you ever left the wings of God? Now, if the wings are eagle wings, oh boy. You know what the eagle does with her eaglets? She picks them up on her back and flies. And I don't know if she does a loop-de-loop -loop or whatever she does. Next thing you know, those eaglets are in the air with no help trying to flap their wings. And Mama Bear, and Mama Bear, why am I getting Mama Bear? Mama Eagle will wait to a certain point and then go and rescue that eagle on the back of her body again and bring her back to the nest. And this keeps happening and happening. And one day that eagle flaps his wings. They're strong. They're powerful. And he flies off. No more time to be under the wings of mama. Time now to go out and, and develop yourself. You may have to leave that church and go off to be a missionary, go off to start a church, or go off to another area, to go off to another church maybe, away from your, your home church, and to help others. Paul did that all the time. He went all over Asia. Sila. Well, guess what that is? That's a musical rest, or a tribulation passage, or a second advent passage. Where do you think Israel is going to hide from the wings? Revelation 12. What does it say? What's it say? What's it say? In Revelation 12, he gave her great wings as an eagle. What did Jesus say? Pray your flight be not. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So you think I'm full of it. You think I'm just, I'm giving you scripture to back it up. By the night tabernacle, if that's the second advent passage, if that's the tribulation passage, that is in Revelation 12, the wilderness where God has them. You better abide in that tabernacle, because if the Jew doesn't, the Antichrist has them. Nahum, or one of the minor prophets, has his entire book dedicated to Edom. And you know what that book says Edom did when Babylon came? That the Jews had escaped. The Edomites, or Esau's brethren, caught them and turned them over to Babylon. That entire book is God rebuking that nation for what they did to Israel. If they were to leave that tabernacle, that place of dwelling, Revelation 12, the wilderness where God has them, they're going to be turned over to the enemies. If not turned over to the enemies, they're going to be turned over to people, the countries that will turn them over to the enemy. And then they're going to lose their neck. For thou, God, O God, 
has heard my vows. Now that's not, do you take this man to be all and take this one? Well, I do. That's not the vow. The vow was offerings that God would receive of you in the Old Testament. Lord, I will vow not only give you 10% of the sheep, but I will give you this sheep, or I will give you this part, whatever it is that you are going to give to God. The offerings. This is a reference to the tabernacle. I will give unto you, Lord, to be burnt offering. It also shows you that in the tribulation period and the millennium, if you check, especially the end of Ezekiel, the tabernacle is going to be, the temple is going to be there, and it's going to be sacrifices. Ezekiel goes so far as to say, I read today, that there's going to be stone tables with hooks. What's that for? To bring the animals and tie them to that hook for them to be slaughtered. By the way, David will be prince in the millennium. Jesus Christ will be the king. So who's writing the Psalms? Thou, God, has given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Listen to me, Christian. You need to read your Bible, number one. Every day, read the Bible at least once through a year. Another book you need to read, you need to read it along with your Bible a couple times a year. You need to read Fox's Book of Moderate. That is your heritage. Those people that are named in that book are your brothers and sisters in the Lord and how they were treated for the word of God and for Jesus Christ. And reading that book, if your heart don't get humble, if you don't realize how vile you are, then the next book you ought to read right along with your Bible, uh, with your Bible every year, and read it again as you to read your Bible, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan, not Paul Bunyan. He had the blue ox. Jesus said, give me the red heifer. You got to know your Baptist history, my friend. Your Baptist history begins in Rhode Island. Works its way through. You got to know your you got to know the names Waldisians. You got to know those names. You're going to hear them in, in heaven. And they're going to put me to shame. Thou, Lord, will prolong the king's life. Now, I don't know if this is a David as king. But if it is Saul, his enemy, guess what he's doing? He's praying for the king. Do you have such an enemy that wants you dead? That has literally tried to kill you and then you're praying for him and his years as many generations long life long live the queen or long live the king is what the English people say comes out of a Bible God saved the king God saved the queen that's scripture Listen, this thing with the president, that is rebellion. The only president you read about in the Bible was in Daniel's time, and one president was good, and there are other presidents wanted that president dead. There were no revivals after, the, after we had presidents in the United States, by the way. Independence from God. Now, let's let me tell you something. I don't care how you feel. Where is God and Jesus Christ in the Declaration of Independence and the Amendments? 
You do know that Thomas Jefferson wrote his own Bible in perversion. Or you're going to get mad at me and cuss me out because I'm going against great America. But speak the truth for once. Pray for the king. I know Christians out there don't pray for the president. I know some Christians out there that pray for the president to die. That is shameful and wickedness. And you expect God to answer your prayer and you expect God to give you a revival? I get more out of Billiam's ass talking than yours. I pray for the president. I pray for his family. For their souls. He doesn't know any better. Only thing he knows is Satan. Doesn't the Bible say that Paul writes that they don't know because they're not of God? They don't have the spirit of God. they got the spirit of the world. You want a president that's going to do right in this country? He needs to be saved. I've read the testimony of the Bushes. I've read the testimony of the Reagans. And I've seen their, their, their fruits. You don't need a Republican. You don't need a Democrat. You need Jesus Christ. Prolonging the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. He, unless David is switching the pronouns here, Saul will not be before God. I mean, that's shaky ground there when it comes to Saul. I mean, as far as the salvation, I say 4951. Which is it? I don't know. One place Samuel says, you shall be with me and your son tomorrow. Another place God says, listen, I removed my spirit from him because he sought the witch. And then Samuel said one time, rebellion is as witchcraft. So I would lean, he's, David's talking about himself, and there are places in the Bible where they switch the pronouns, and they're talking about themselves, but they make it the third person. He shall abide before God forever, and that's, if that's David, it will. David will be prince in the millennium. And he will live in the new earth. <laughs> O oh, prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him, the king. There's no mercy in America. When you get a couple who's lived their life, and they had a mortgage, and the husband worked hard, and the wife worked hard, and they paid the mortgage up, and they raised the children, or maybe they had no children, whatever the case is. And then when one of them dies, and the government comes to the, the surviving spouse and says, you owe inheritance tax, that is no mercy. When you tax the guy out of his paycheck, and then you tax him at the store, and you tax him for this, and you tax him a tax on top of a tax tax tax, that's unmerciful. And then when you take that money and misuse it, you're going to give an account to God for what you've done and the miseries that call out. Listen, there are Christians today that are calling out to God saying, Lord, this, this country is overwhelming me. I can't make it. And the Bible says, God says, I hear you. Truth. I dealt with a guy the other day. I said, listen, when it comes to your unemployment, the numbers look good because the people fall off the job rolls. They don't get a check no more. So that makes it look like it's good. And they don't want to hear it. Everything's hunky-dory. Well, listen, America, you want to believe those lies. God will let you believe those lies. And then when you find out what the truth is one day, 
Don't be shocked. Don't act ignorant or stupid. America is failed. Now, I, I was going to make it sound like America is failing. No, she's not is. She is failed. And she don't even know it. When you have a justice system, because your name is in the paper, your name is in the credits, your name is for throwing a ball, and you can get out from judgment because of who you are, whereas you don't get the same judgment that somebody else gets because of your popularity, that is untrue. I think the statue of justice that used to ha have a blindfold, I think she's got her neck stuck in sand like the ostrich. The bald eagle of America has turned into a plucked chicken in a bucket. Don't ask me. Look at, look at Sunday. Look how much chicken will be cooked. Look how many people close down churches or they have the churches open so they can have that stupid ball game. I just read the other, I just read today that they're going to have a youth a vacation Bible. I forgot what it was called because it's the, the, the football game. They're going to use the football game to, you know, for a vacation Bible. Prayer, that's what it was, prayer bowl. Why are you using the world's tactics? That's not the truth. The world knows no truth. The world rejects the truth, and you're going to use the worldly system. Now, let me say something. I'm going to kick some idols out there right now. If they were really born-again Christians, they wouldn't be playing on Sunday night. They would be in a church house. And they would allow you to be in church where you belong. Whatever star position you're in, you walk up to the coach and say, Coach, I ain't going to play because I'm a Christian. I'm going to be in church. And I ain't going to play because I see what these churches are going to do, and it defies God. So hey, you can count me out of the play. Go ahead. Fire me. I don't care. I'm going to stand for Jesus. All these idiots that run around the left hand turn around the track. Oh, we're Christians. Yeah, we do it on Sunday with Budweiser and other beer names on our cars and cigarette stickers on our cars. But we do it in the name of Jesus. That's not the truth. You got Christmas and Easter in the pulpits today. That's not the truth. Easy believism. I listened to a, a preacher today preach and come on out and told us that we think that the, pros the prosperity gospel is foolish. You're foolish. No, that's the untruth. There is no truth which may preserve him. Listen, no mercy and truth. There's no preservance. I'm going to be preserved. When this body is dead or raptured, I'm going to be called up to heaven, absent from the body to be present with the Lord, preserved. Matter of fact, I'm going to be so preserved that one day God's going to give me a new body. How about that? I had somebody email me through these videos, oh, get rid of the beard. How do you know? Maybe in heaven we'll all have beards. Jesus had a beard. All the all the, the Israelites were to have a beard. I can imagine you Catholics out there when you see Mary have a beard. No, you don't even know the Bible. Know what I said there? I'm preserved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you bring these people into these worldly things that I just talked about. And you do it by a worldly way and not by the way, by the truth or the life. They're not preserved.
I think we have a dangerous gospel. I, I don't know what the name of it is. There should be a name out there. Uh, you know, just, uh, I, just say this prayer. But there's even something worse than just say this prayer. It's when a church goes out there and uses the world, the world tactics to get you saved. And you are not saved. I don't. I, I don't believe God would use the world for you to be saved. I'll give you one illustration. A church back in my home state, every two, two, two times a year, they would bring the teenagers in with rock groups and booze to get them saved. You think Jesus would do that? No. There's no truth, there's no mercy, and there's no preservance without truth or mercy. You ain't believing in the way, the truth, and the life. You're not preserved. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever. Singing to God. Praising God. Praising his holy name. That I, w that I may daily perform my vows. Now, in the Old Testament, there were vows to be done. And there are also a vow that I'm going to do this. And you don't realize that the Bible says that if you have a vow, God expects you to perform it. Listen to me. If you were in a military, and you were in a battle or war, and you said, God, if you get me out of this, I'll do fill in the blank. If you have not done what you filled in the blank, you better get it done before you before you die. Because God will hold you accountable. Brother, sister, you stood before a preacher and say, I do, and you didn't. I call that marriage vows. Oh Lord, I'm going to fast for two days. And then you don't. You violated a vow. Solomon says, and he goes, you better not just, just keep your mouth shut. Say it in my own words. Shut up. That's my own words. Then speak foolish. For, you know, don't, don't cry before the angels. And I'm not quoting it completely. That it was an error. Not in the eyes of God, not in the ears of God. God is holy, and we are not. We are to pray to God. Sing, our, sing your prayers. Let it come from the heart. Even if you're in pain, even if you're suffering, sing out to the Lord. Maybe make you feel better. I, I've never tried it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say I've never tried that. But maybe it'll work. They say that, you know, songs will cheerful the heart and songs are a good medicine. They singing to God and praising God through song. May it make the housework a little easier. May it make the job go by a little easier. I mean, I wouldn't say, I got the joy, joy, joy. Oh, I hate the job. Oh, I hate. I wouldn't do it like that. I mean, I've got the joy, joy, joy down deep in my heart. I'm in a lot of pain, but it could be worse, Lord. Could be. Let the Lord be your shelter. Let the Lord put you on a rock. Be forever with the Lord. Don't step out on the Lord. Stay where the Lord is. Ask the Lord if you are in the place where the Lord wants you. And maybe be prepared to move. Either you are maybe not in the right place where God wants you, or maybe God's okay. I'm waiting. I was waiting for you to say that. Let's now move. I mean, the worst thing in life is to move. I've done it so many times. This entire psalm is just written to us in prayer and in God. I think I heard somewhere in God we trust. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder come.
I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God.